Hi, and welcome to Melbourne Conversations, Truth Telling, Cook's Cottage and Cook's Legacy. I'm Claire Land. I'm a non-Aboriginal historian. I'm proudly a member of um, staff at Mundani Balak Indigenous Academic Unit at Victoria University, which um, includes some of my key teachers, in particular Gary Foley. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners um, where we're speaking today, the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung language group and the Boon language group as well. Um, and I also want to introduce Paola, Paola Bella. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. Um, before I say any more, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, traditional owners, um, Boon and Woiwurrung of the Wurundjeri peoples, uh, the Greater Kulin Nations and uh, acknowledge that this is um, ceded sovereign country um, and yeah to acknowledge the also the unceded nature of country itself and people in our community's resistance. Um, thanks for having me Claire. <laughs> it's great to be here together and yeah it's a special event for us it's a culmination of a couple of years work so yeah, but first just want to mention that this event is part of the monthly Melbourne Conversations series run by the City of Melbourne. We'll be compiling questions throughout the event via the Slido platform and the details of that are on the chat in, um, in YouTube in terms of how to ask a question. And also letting you know you can subscribe to this Knowledge Melbourne channel to stay up to date with Melbourne Conversations events. Um, now, I just want to acknowledge country on behalf of the City of Melbourne and their protocol is to acknowledge country after housekeeping, just to make sure that acknowledging country um, it re remains a fundamental part of the conversation itself. So the City of Melbourne respectfully acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land, the Bunurong, Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pays respects to their elders past and present. Um, City of Melbourne is committed to their reconciliation journey because at its heart, reconciliation is about strengthening relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples for the benefit of all Victorians. And um, we also want to acknowledge the first peoples of whichever lands you're joining from us from digitally today. Okay, so yeah, at this point we want to break open this book that we're launching. Um, so I might just go to our slides. There we go, Black Cookbook, um, New Cultural Perspectives on Cook's Cottage, a set of provocations by myself, um, Paola Bella and Kate Golding. Um, yeah, so we're launching the book today, Paola. <laughs> I think it surprised us <laughs> how quickly this has happened. Um, and also just, you know, I think we want to shout out just everyone tuning in um, who've been looking forward to joining us um, in person. So obviously... Uh, where, you know, there's an unfolding COVID situa situation that we're all experiencing again uh, in Melbourne and Victoria. So I just want to acknowledge too that it's somewhat stressful. <laughs> it's a bit discombobulating. So I want to thank everyone for, you know, um, making it possible for us to, you know, live stream it in this way. And thanks for tuning in if if you are while you're eating your dinner or whatever it is that you're doing right now. <laughs> um, but I think before we forget and get into some of the content that we're really excited to share with you, um, we do want to thank um, Melbourne Conversations for having us uh, in the City of Melbourne, obviously, um, who commissioned um, Claire, um, who brought myself and Kate into this project. But we'll, we'll talk about the story of sort of how it came about in a little bit because we're organised and we're not organised, so we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> we'll get through with best the best we can, but we are really excited about sharing this with you um, and with um, the public. Um, but we do really want to thank um, Sophia from the City of Melbourne for all of your encouragement and support um, and for looking after us through this process, which started how long ago? Was it two years ago? Two or three years? Two years. Thanks, Kate. Two years. It seems <laughs> longer. Um, and so thank you. Um, and uh, Kate, thank you so much um, for all of your efforts and um, your incredible uh, research and your work into Cook's Legacy is one of the reasons that we wanted you on board with this. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and before, can I just say something else? 
I can, can't we? I'm going to anyway. Um, I want to <laughs> acknowledge the resistance of um, our ancestral f freedom fighters um, to all the activists, protectors and warriors who work for country and for the memorialisation um, of those who have died in the genocide of the establishment of this colony. Um, we can't talk about Cook's legacy and what the cottage itself represents without talking about um, the acts of resistance to it and to, um, you know, our, our fallen heroes in our community who have fought for country for us for a very long time um, and that these survivals and acts of resistance um, that form a part of our response within the Black Cookbook. Yeah. Um, I guess we also wanted to um, just mention our dedication, which is to um, the late Tracy Barnavanua Ma, who's an incredible historian whose work, um, decolonisation and the Pacific in particular, has um, has really reflected itself into this book because she's offered so much with her original research into. Um, the networks of resistance across the Pacific and the decolonising movements both here and in across that whole area. So, yeah, acknowledging Tracy today. And as well, this is a key image for us which we wanted to include. It's, it, it was the title image for today's event. Um, it's an image by Lisa Belia, the late Lisa Belia. Um, I'm wearing the T-shirt um, from that from that um, protest and um, it's outside Cook's Cottage and it's a protest in which um, Robbie Thorpe um, had the cottage wrapped in crime scene tape and you can see um, protesters from Camp Sovereignty which was um, an occupation of King's Domain um, in 2006 in concert with the, um, the Stolen Wealth Games, the Commonwealth Games. Um, and you can see Wayne Thorpe and Robbie Corowa amongst the protesters um, there at, at the cottage. Um, and yeah, I guess just wanted to especially acknowledge Robbie Thorpe um, as a member of the Gunai Kurnai peoples um, whose lands were the first to be um, sighted um, from the endeavour when it came up the east coast of Australia in April 1770 and um, whose people then heralded um, the arrival of Cook by sending smoke signals all the way up the coast and um, by indicating their occupation um, through numerous fires. And, and so the smoke signals and the fires were really um, um, part of the, the core of the, the lens that we brought to this whole project. And, and Robbie Thorpe is, has shared those stories um, with, with both of us over the years. So a um, shout out to Robbie as well. Absolutely. Okay, um, so Paula, I wonder if you wanted to talk about, um, yeah, just the dilemma of even engaging in a project around Cook's Cottage. Are you talking about my <laughs> response when you said, would you like to work on it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Claire and I both work together at Mindani Balak and that's the Indigenous Academic Centre at Victoria University and she knocked on my door, <laughs> on my office door and said, you know, I've got this project and wondering if you'd like to work on it and I said, what is it? And she told me and I said, why the hell would I want to work on something, anything to do with Cook's Cottage apart from um, protesting it? Um, <laughs> so I guess it triggered a response in me that you know, for, for many of us in the community and not to speak on other community members' behalf but from my own family and community that I can, that I've had conversations with, it's a side of contestation and one that you're not comfortable with and it's one that represents um, so much, um, you know, trauma and memory and it's a, hold, a holding place in a sense um, even though he's a pivotal figure and, and a figure at the beginning of what some call the end for us at the beginning of this genocide, the beginning of being unsettled. Um, there are other figures also, but um, there was something about its celebration and then it being held in a sort of, you know, vaulted position of history telling that really itched my skin. <laughs> um, and I had to stop and really think about it. And, and I thought about um, the responsibility I have as an educator um, and I thought about our role in the way we educate, um, you know, undergrad and postgrad students at, at VU. And as many black educators would know all over this colony, um, that often when we get students at a first year level, even at a postgrad level, their level of knowledge about 
the actual history of Australia and black peoples and our cultures and knowledges in this place is very, very, very limited. And we have to work very hard as black educators to get people up to speed to even begin the units that they're undertaking with us. And we see this happen in cycles in this country um, through the lack of a lack of generational education through the primary and secondary system. So once people get to university, they might be encountering their first, you know, Aboriginal lecturer or Torres Strait Islander lecturer, South Sea Islander lecturer, um, and their first specific Indigenous units. So there's a lot of catching up to do. Um, and me, like many of our people, and it's something we relayed in the publication, that first experience when you're at school, um, and it's usually at primary school, for most black kids, when you get told that Cook discovered you, you, you and your people, that you were found by this person, it's a, it's a insult to your existence and to your elders and to your family. And it's a real shock to the system and it becomes this pivotal moment in your education where it feels like the entire classroom and school start spinning around you and you start to understand how you're seen as the Aboriginal student, not as an equal student, but as an Aboriginal student, because you're then in a position where you either have to contest that or you become withdrawn or you might become angry or you might um, react in a variety of ways. But most of us can remember the first time <laughs> we were told that we were found by this figure. And so it becomes a very abstract, strange experience. So I'm really, I'm glad we touched on that in here and I, I'm glad that I did agree. <laughs> <laughs> to, to come into this project with you because I thought about the responsibility of changing narratives and giving students the opportunity to make up their own minds, to, to learn various perspectives um, so they can, you know, as you've said, engage with history fully informed. Mm. They need to be informed. They need to be able to make their own minds up about this and um, know, you know know how to respond to history and how to actually start defining it for what it, it will be in the future. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, through this conversation with Paula about what would... would there be conditions in which it would be possible to, to for her to work on this and, and for me as well to not... I couldn't take on a, a project like this without being in conversation with Indigenous scholars and, and, and working with Paula was great um, because we'd, we had worked together before but it's not usually my practice to go and ask someone to work with me. Um, usually I like it to be the other way around as a non-Aboriginal person. So it was it was a lot of sort of tension and dile dilemmas for both of us, I think, in how this came about. But it also meant that we needed to talk about um, the brief with um, the City of Melbourne because it was originally that we would write materials, research and write materials that could be included within the displays within the cottage. And the displays within the cottage, the interpretive displays, had not been um, long revised. They'd actually been renovated not that long ago, um, but they still only made passing reference to sort of the existence of Aboriginal people or let alone First Nations people that were, you know, for whom Cook's Cottage, Cook, sorry, brought about a whole new era. Um, and so it was a sense of we actually can't provide that. We can provide a response or a provocation to ask people to think differently about this and, um, and a resource to the city and the, the tour guides who are helping to interpret this, but we could not sort of redeem the cottage to be something that would be across a culturally safe or culturally um, have have two perspectives in it because you know it, it's just too too much itself, <laughs> um, even though it is inauthentic in key ways. Um, so yeah, so that was that was. Um, yeah, oh no, so sorry, I was just going to say, it's just sort of reminding me that, um, it, you know, in, in my work experience um, years ago when I was a primary school teacher and um, went into some secondary teaching and then, you know, at this university level, my work also involved, um, you know, working here where we are at Melbourne Museum and particularly in Bunjalaka, the Aboriginal Cultural Centre, on the floor as a customer service officer and then years later... Um, after finishing my Bachelor of Education, I got to be a curator in First Peoples. And all of these roles gave me the chance to interact with students and members of the public, including tourists, and to really hear their impressions of our history in this place, in this city. And so I had this real inkling about who was visiting the cottage, uh, who, you know, who um, 
what type of people, what kind of age groups, what demographics, you know, would be coming in. So we we did think really clearly about who we were writing for as well. That was something that mm. we did consider really carefully. So I'm really grateful for that, even though there was that tussle. But I think when black fellows and white fellows work together, unless there's a tussle, something's wrong. Like if it's going to be an equal, open, you know, working in good relationship, mm. like Professor Ali Morton Robin talks about, working in good relations, you need to have that, you know, so I'm glad <laughs> <laughs> after all that. <laughs> so that's <good. laughs> Yeah. Um, so just wanted to perhaps at this point share something with you from the Aboriginal History Archive. Whenever we felt like getting a little bit of public attention, you could always be guaranteed to get a headline. If you bought a can of paint down here to Hyde Park in Sydney and chucked it over Captain Cook here, he was regarded as the original invader. We regarded those as fairly harmless, which they were, I mean, you know, compared to some of the things some people were doing. Um, and yet they still had the effect of, to a certain extent, alienating us from some of the older generation of Aboriginal political activists, some of the more conservative older generation who'd uh, been more into the tactics of uh, Martin Luther King. We were the generation that come along and said, we demand the right to self-determination, the right to control our own affairs. And that, to us, was what black power meant. You know what? In the long run, I reckon we'd be better off with a more restrictive immigration policy. OK, so... Um... If you have just tuned in um, and just joined us online, my name's Claire Land. I'm with Paola Bella. This is a Melbourne conversation. Um, it's called Truth Telling, Cook's Cottage and Cook's Legacy. If you want to add your question to our, our compilation of questions, we may answer in Q&A. <laughs> um, you, um, you can find instructions for how to do that um, in the chat on the channel. Okay, so just um, wrapping up that, that little video we wanted to play you. I think there's, there's lots in that. Um, there's lots in there about, about um, Foley goes... That, that, that was Gary Foley speaking initially about um, this black power tactic of, of getting attention for an issue by chucking a, a, a can of paint over Cook's cottage. So, I mean, Cook... The, the cap, Captain Cook. Um, and so I just love that because it's, it's, you know, it's not an attempt to pull down a statue. It's not an attempt. It's not, um, you know, really taking issue with Cook, Cook himself. It, it, it's just that that is a sacred cow. Cook's, Cook is a sacred cow. And to get attention um, for whatever issue it is at that moment for the Black Power Movement to chuck, a, to chuck a can of paint over that would send the journalist running to get your story. And I just love the, the smartness of that. Um, and also, um, Folly then just went on to talk about um, not the response of, of the media or, or um, you know, what non-Aboriginal people would think about this, but how um, an older generation of Aboriginal activists had responded to these kinds of tactics, these new um, in-your-face tactics. And I guess I just also love that because it speaks to how we tried to approach this project of, okay, we wanted to go back to some of the journals from the olden days um, on the on the voyages, um, but we also wanted to resurrect from the archive um, hints and indications of what was going on um, cross-culturally between Aboriginal people, between First Nations of the Pacific who were brought in touch with each other through the cottage, who communicated with each other through as I said, smoke signals to strategize about these newcomers. Um, and also we wanted to take a cue from um, um, First Nations artists' um, responses to Cook because that sharp critique and that really, you know, that pro provocation was something that we thought was, was needed to speak back to, to something like The Cottage. Um, so do you want to talk about some of the, the artworks that we decided to... To kind of present in the in the book. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And just on that, um, if you do want to watch uh, that clip, uh, it's on uh, Professor Gary Foley's website, um, which I think we can provide in the link. But um, it's at greeweb. dot com. dot com. Can't remember. <laughs> we'll double check. But yeah, on the that. Garrett, the the, <coughs> the Koori History um, website, website. Yeah, it's famous, and you should check it out for sure. Yeah. Um, and 
yeah, uh, just on that um, first before we talk a little bit more about the, the, the artists, um, I, I love, you know, that response of um, an immediate action, an act of intervention, the throwing the paint, which is actually, actually like a, you know, performance art in itself, um, which in other situations might be celebrated, but, you know, Blackfellas attempt to do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of policing and resistance to our resistance, um, which was only, you know, again recently brought up um, in the global Black Lives Matter movement, but also in the global in the Black Lives Matter movement here, um, and the reactions to um, the protection of Cook statue at Hyde Park, where police actually circled it, at just at the mere thought of Aboriginal people and allies perhaps pulling it down or even attempting to. Um, and meanwhile, um, we're seeing, you know, Japarung trees um, that Aboriginal women uh, are protecting um, here um, being cut down and threatened to be cut down constantly. So there's always threat of violence about our memorials, you know, to our people and our ancestors. So this notion of what's in the memorial landscape is so Im important and, um, you know, I, I love that film for that reason because of the different things it touches on but also the diversity of opinion in community and that generational difference in how to do things as well. Um, and, you know, when Professor Foley talks about that was black power for us, that's, you know, um, what a self-determined act of resistance looks like. So it was from that place, you know, we looked at the artists to um, think about who'd made work specifically about Cook and Cook's legacy that mightn't have been known to a broader audience perhaps, and maybe not to school audiences or... Um, you know, primary and secondary um, students. And we're really excited thinking about how they would react and get excited um, by these very, um, what might be described as provocative, but we're really acts of um, correction, <laughs> I like to call them, but also, um, you know, truth-telling in, in visual art through these artists. So, yeah. I love all of the work, so it's sort of hard to pinpoint one, but maybe as we go through we can... Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Talk to some. And um, I mean, this one here from Callum Morton, um, it does have a soundtrack with it, which has kind of bawdy music. Um, and it's sort of inside this genteel, gorgeous little cottage. It's actually there's maybe something a bit um, bit raucous or a um, bit kinky going on even. And, um, and it does as well speak to the fact that the cottage was brought over here brick by brick um, from England um, to to sit there in the gardens and um, it was just weird in so many ways, partly because it was brought to um, commemorate the 100th anniversary of colonisation here by um, Batman and it, and Cook never came here and all as this a, sort of stuff. As a gift. Yeah. Very public. As a gift to gift. the people of Melbourne yeah. by a philanthropist. So, yeah. And I guess – and this Christian Thompson work here, I mean, it's sort of – there's a lot of things it says, but it does speak to this question of who was he? Is such a who was Cook? He's such a um, symbolic figure, but what do we really know about him? And what exactly did he do? Um, and and you know we don't know who is holding, um, who's holding that placard, but the person can see through um, eye holes in the in the picture, and so you, I guess you wonder what it says about there being a little bit of Cook in all of us, or or um, as those of us of colonial backgrounds. Um, as well as you know, looking, looking out through his through his way of seeing the world. Yeah, um, and that flipping, you know, this colonial lens, um, and and art as history in its own mm. as, as well. Um, art as a form of storytelling and narrative building about what we know of of the nation, you know. So, um, but but also just back on Callum's um, in particular, as it references, you know, the cottage itself, that a lot of people don't realise that Cook never lived in it. Um, and so um, it's I, I didn't know that until I got to a particular age and I think a lot of people don't know that and it's something that um, Sean McAuliffe touched on in that very funny article that he wrote, <laughs> sort of enlightening people about yep. why do we care so much about this place, why does it hold such a firm place in our you know, collective sort of memory and this national sense um, of the city and of being, you know, a Melbourneian. Um, so I thought that was hilarious to be... A little bit, um, you know, subversive about this. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, and there is some ivy on the outside of the cottage, and that's actually the most authentic thing about it because that was a cutting from the ivy in England on the cottage, and it's just so eloquent in terms of being an invasive weed and all that sort of stuff. So I, I kind of like 
that that's there. Um, and his, it was his parents' home. It was. But not his. Yeah. 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 Bef- yeah, that's right. And, you know, like there's this myth-making about Cook as well that he was um, – he didn't use a lot of violence. There was not a lot of blood sh- shed on the voyages. I mean, he did actually personally shoot Aboriginal people, Gwagal people, um, when he did show up at Botany Bay. But uh, we wanted to include this cannon from the Endeavour, um, this photo of this cannon, because – what he actually did was he did use a lot of violence. He used he actually displayed his whole repertoire of of guns, um, from handguns and little shot and to th- up and to the, th- through to the cannon. So if they, he ever, he ever got any type of resistance to showing up in someone else's um, you know um, harbour, he would um, he would warn people with a display of the firepower and. Um, you know, let people know that. So it was through force of of violence that um, he indicated we can absolutely, um, you know, just basically exterminate everybody if we so choose. So just do what we say. So and that's that's coercion. It's complete violence, and um, so there's no way in which he was, um, you know, a peaceful. Um, you know, he didn't. He he wanted to avoid um, embarrassing and uncomfortable situations, mm-hmm. um, but he he needed to get his way. What was yeah. it? A wholesale widespread home invasion, which is an act of violence in itself. So, I think challenges are those, um, yeah, like you said, those ideas that it was a benign process, mm. um, you know, need to be challenged. Yeah. Mm. So, I think that's one of the reasons why these images were so important now, like the curation of them was really, yeah, key. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, here we go to another film. People came in tall ships. News of their arrival travelled quickly. To the original inhabitants, the British looked a motley and peculiar crew. But they were given a watery greeting and at first, spirits, including Captain Phillips, were high. But then... The British started throwing their weight around. God save our gracious King, long live In fact, it wasn't long-lived at all. OK, we're chappy. We don't recognise your rights. This is your part of the fauna. <laughs> That's OK. You don't mind being that part of that. Gilbert, we're boy by our law. Go through our customs and pay the rent. Well, you're welcome to stay. Put him back on the boat. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Captain Philip was sent packing. Convicts who agreed to acknowledge Aboriginal sovereignty and pay rent were allowed to stay. Organisers say their Invasion Day ceremony highlights how whites should have behaved 205 years ago. This is not an opposition to Australia Day, it's an alternative for those Australians who uh, understand the true nature of the invasion of our country in the first instance and who feel that they want to make some sort of amends. The day finished as it started, black and white dancing together. Another small step towards making amends. Okay, so um, that's obviously a, a news report of um, an event organised by... You saw Gary Foley on screen. You also heard Robbie Thorpe's voice and you could recognise um, the pay the rent um, and the, the customs that... Um, that Robbie talks about so you know this is an alternative there was there was an opportunity there were actually instructions to cook that he should get the consent of the natives um and that he should you know um uh, he, this was part of the reason he he went um to the east coast was to try to find um as much information for a prospective invasion as he possibly could but also ironically I mean I don't understand how he could do that with the consent of the natives but um, in quote marks, but um, that was the instruction, and you know, um, there was there there were existing protocols for how to go about um, visiting somewhere or even staying somewhere, and pay the rent is is um, is a, a part of saying that. Um, but I guess um, also just to mention that um, Cook's journal itself is actually now seen to have been um, partially fabricated. Um, because uh, there's a whole book about this and, and John Howard himself writes the preface to the book, right? Um, you know, he, he was the one who did a massive campaign a- against revisionist history, against black armband history, against um, this idea that there has been 
um, just so much frontier violence and so many massacres in Australia. And he, he forces people back to the historical record to say, prove to me exactly um, how you get your numbers for how, how many um, Aboriginal people were, were killed. Um, but he actually backs this book that, that's been written, which um, rereads um, Cook's journal and um, finds those parts in which he actually um, left bits out. It's called Lying for the Admiralty. And what, it, what this is about is, you know, Cook was trying to find out information for the prospective invasion. So he was looking for um, good harbours, um, new shipping routes. So he was trying to find out, did Bass Strait exist? Was there a gap between the mainland and Tassie? Could you send a ship through there? Um, and he actually, it's it's now th thought that he did um, know about Sydney Harbour, but he didn't write that in his journal. He didn't write the existence of Bass Strait in his journal because um, crew were actually selling information to other colonial powers. Um, so he kept information from some of his crew about um, some of the investigations that he did. Um, and so just just to kind of point out that when you're looking for the truth, um, it's very often the, the white records that are seen to be, um, you know, the primary source. Um, and, you know, oral histories or oral traditions seem to be somehow um, suspicious. But, you know, what we find um, through through research projects such as this is something quite different. Mm. Yeah. Um, and another clip that was found on um, the Koori History website too. Yes. Yeah. With the yeah. um, permission of Professor Foley. Uh, so it's kooriweb.org. So please check it out if you don't know about it already. Yeah. I guess just wanted to maybe talk about some of the highlights from the book. I mean, this, this page actually has a couple of highlights. There's two Robbie Thorpe poems in this book. Um, one of them is, is called... Um, uh, waving the rules, um, so ruling Britannia rules the waves and waves the rules, um, and then this amazing eloquent work by Jason Wing, um, which actually appears in the poster. So we have a poster as a part of the book. Um, so very excited about that. So I reckon that's that's a pretty big highlight for me. Yeah, and we also really want to thank, um, you know, with great. Gratitude to the artists who did um, give permission uh, to have their works featured in this publication and also to the estates um, who manage uh, the work of um, some artists who have passed away whose work appears in it. And, um, you know, we're really grateful uh, that they agreed. And, um, you know, when you agree to place your work in a publication, there's always a lot of, like, you know, we talked about before, the tussles of deciding where your work goes, especially as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artist. There's a lot of um, deliberation that goes into it. So we're really um, happy and grateful for um, the works that are featured. And we think that they make such a great contribution to these conversations and we really will excite um, people who are looking for this other narrative and to see that... So many uh, Indigenous artists have created these incredible counter-narratives to this legacy and truth-telling um, in stark contrast to what you're talking about, you know, what history books and historians seen, being seen as always being honest, <laughs> um, <laughs> which we know not to be true, um, and for our stories and ways of being to be seen as um, secondary sources and underhand and, and not as valid. So um, it is really exciting to feature them, so we're really grateful to them. Yes. Um, so, I mean, there's there's a lot to this book. We can't go through the entire whole thing um, and, and we won't really attempt to um, because, yeah, there, there's a lot to um, – there's a lot of detail in here. Um, it is available. It, yes. On the City of Melbourne's yes. website as a downloadable PDF. So um, make sure you have a look at it, download it and um, – copies in themselves <laughs> <laughs> which are these gorgeous beautifully designed um and thank you so much Stephen at Letterbox. we're very excited um at how incredible it looks and feels um the availability of them though Claire what is the availability of the actual hard copy if you want a hard copy um you actually have to go down to Fitzroy Gardens to the visitor centre um, and yeah, go adjacent to, adjacent to the cottage, not cottage. in the cottage, but adjacent to the cottage. And, um, yeah, so get your limited edition there. And this is, uh, our beautiful poster. So, oops, 
We've got the Jason wing work there on one side. And the other side, which might be worth having a bit of a conversation about, is our, our time spiral. Um, yes, which is a non-linear decolonised timeline. Um, and, yeah, we just really wanted to get a sense in there of the many... I mean, this is a huge story. There's, you know, there were three voyages. Each voyage took three voyages by Cook um, in the Pacific and each of them took two to three years. So there are countless um, cross-cultural encounters that happened. Um, that, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of, of landings and all that sort of thing. And we, um, we wanted to sort of represent some of those things, but we wanted to sort of bring that from a different perspective. Um, and so we've organised um, some moments in time around um, surveillance, networks, ceremony, regulating outsiders um, and knowledges, and just to get that sense of both stability and change. Um, so how um, First Nations peoples have survived, have brought cultural resources to these new encounters and have resisted as well as have continued despite this upheaval. Um, there is still continuity and stability of, of worldviews, of networks and and knowledges and ceremony, as I said. So um, we hope that there's a lot in there um, to provoke you to, to learn more. Yeah. Um, we will go to questions in a little in a little while in a few more minutes, and just want to remind people to put your questions on Slido. Um, Paula, do you reckon there's anything that you want to highlight from from the book? Um, I, as much as I adore all of the black art in this, um, and it's incredibly important, I was very fascinated by that. Um, that little object that I know um, you were able to talk a little bit about and teach me about um, and I'd really love you to share that because what I found in that was that it challenged, I think it challenged in me, um, uh, you know, a, not an ambivalence and it's definitely not hatred, it's like just an indifference that I have to Cook and to Cook's legacy and what, what that represents. But what I found in this was not not an empathy for him but for his family mm. and for me that is about the sense of respect and dignity that I feel very grateful to be given as an Aboriginal woman because that's how my matriarchs, that's how my family, that's how my aunties and uncles behave. It's always with a sense of dignity and respect even when that isn't always necessarily afforded our people and there's something in that and even in the 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 clip before, you know, where the pay the rent, um, um, you know, protest performance um, and in that as the report sort of concludes and says, you know, despite all the politics of the day that black and white gathered together to dance. And I, I was saying to Claire earlier, who else but black fellas would put on a concert and a feed and make white people feel welcome? And our people do that every single invasion day. Every single Invasion Day, our people, not far from the cottage, make everyone in this city feel welcome to come and join with us um, at the Share the Spirit concert. You know, and that takes an incredible amount of integrity. And I think that gets forgotten that our people have that integrity and a sense of compassion for humanity, even when it's buried in a little, <laughs> you know, object like that. Mm. So I just, that sparked that in me. So I'd like you to talk to that if mm. you can, if you don't mind. Yeah, so this little object um, on the right of the screen is a ditty box. It's a little tiny memorial, and it, it fits in the in, it fits in an adult's hand. And it's the most authentic thing about Cook in this whole country. It it just it lives in the State Library of New South Wales, and it's it was actually made um, for Cook's wife by the crew of the Endeavour after he was killed in Hawaii, um, and they took a piece of wood from the boat, the Endeavour, they carved it, they put um, words around each part of it, they included a watercolour inside which is a painting of the bay in which he died that, um, and also included a lock of his hair and, and they gave it to his wife, um, you know, a, as for her grieving. And, um, you know, that's that really speaks to him, you know, 
as an individual, he's highly symbolic figure, of course, but um, he he was just one man um, who had his family and and who did um, perish and all that sort of stuff, um, and that's that's a cause of, of of celebration, you know, like the fact that he was actually killed on, um, in the middle of of this colonial act that he was doing. But um, but you know, I mean that that speaks to also um, the fact that. Cook did die. Um, he does not still live, despite the fact that there's a statue, a life-size statue of him next to the cottage, <laughs> and there's so many statues of him everywhere. And the fact um, that non-Indigenous Australia and our legal system, we still follow his law. Um, all of those things speak to some notion that he still lives. And um, no, in fact, he he did die. And um, you know, his his. Um, his part of the story of Aboriginal nations is is important, but not foundational. Um, and, 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 and those are all things I need to cite back to those who scholars and, and critics who who, who right. mention those words I've just quoted. Um, and, and and the uncle, um, you know, he shares that sen- sentiment in this and talks about the fact that he says, you know, it's white people act as if he didn't die. Um, for Aboriginal people, we're very aware. We know that he's dead. Um, the Hawaiians meted out justice to him um, and that's an act that is respected um, by, you know, Indigenous peoples all over the world, um, that it was an act of justice. So, um, and all the myth-making that that goes around that. But it's just this notion of that when someone is constantly valorised in a landscape, it makes them larger than life and, in a sense, you know, this sort of... Godlike in a supposedly secular government and country, <laughs> um, but one that erases our Aboriginal spirituality from you know the landscape. So, yeah, I think there's some real truths there. But that that object for me, I thought if anything would connect a child to his humanity, it was that to see. But it's also that it, its actual size is very small, and I thought that was a more realistic fitting. Um, you know, human uh, response to his passing. Yeah. Okay, well, we might actually go to questions. And, yeah, um, this is a a photo by um, Kate Golding of the Milby Wall up in um, Cooktown. Um, And and that speaks to that notion of um, it's a timeline from the perspective um, of, of the people of that area um, who plays Cook? Just one small part of of that of that timeline. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I love that image too. Um, uh, and just thinking about people interacting with um, the legacy that is, uh, we've got some questions. So one is: in your work compiling the book, which elements of Cook's legacy did you find had the greatest number of stories, or was the most contested part of his story? a big question <laughs> which elements of cook's legacy did you find had the greatest number of stories or was the most contested what do you think or i'd love to hear more about the decolonized time spiral please you may choose your question <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that fa- i find that start first question really really hard mm, it yeah is hard. yeah so maybe we start with the second one. Start with unless second you one. had, yeah, unless you had. No, I want to. I want to yeah. come back to that one. But yeah. I think um, the talking about this notion of a decolonized time spiral and why um, why it's like that. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, there's this um, amazing um, kind of. There's two words um, on this spiral that I love. One is um, BC, so before Cook. Um, um, you know, this whole era before um, before he came. Um, and there had been many other visitors um, to this continent um, that didn't intend to come and, and stay and, and usurp. So, you know, um, he wasn't the first um, non-Aboriginal person to show up here, um, but he did bring in this whole era and, and the pre haole era as well. That was um, a, a Hawaiian term for, um, you know, this same idea. Um, but the spiral, I guess, we wanted to be able to, you know, include a lot more um, information, um, and you know, just a different way of 
of um, interacting. You've got your a lot of visuals in the book. You've got a lot of text, and we wanted to have something a bit more, um, you know, that that you could come at from a different angle. Um, and as I said, yeah, we couldn't have like a a linear timeline. Like that's just a certain worldview. That's a certain way of looking at things. A very Western way, and and so we needed to have um, something that evoked. Um, um, sort of cultural continuity and a sort of cyclic nature of, of, of understanding time. Yeah, and, and also to sort of um, unflatten or not to reflatten, you know, the work and the concepts that the artists and especially things like decookalization, like there's some incredible terms that have been created by artists and creatives to talk about this time, you know, in the BC, the notion of BC, um, and also this a, a tracing um, as opposed to following, you know. So that's that's what I was excited about in regards to that. Yeah. Hmm. You want to try that first question? question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just I just want to maybe just speak to something that I really enjoyed learning about through the research and that was the smoke signals. I just love the smoke signals. Um, and, you know, like um, Deborah Bird Rose and, and other non-Aboriginal historians have, have done amazing work um, um, collecting stories of the arrival of Cook, but from all over. So, um, you know, so many nations in um, in the con this continent um, have an oral record of Cook's arrival and, you know, but they never not not that they ever saw him, but they they recorded that he had he had shown up. And the way that we know that happened is because of the cool signalling that um, Aboriginal people had this whole system um, of smoke signals from hilltop to hilltop, um, and were able to you know when when Cook or other invaders would show up, um, they'd often say, oh, we came across. A, a corroboree. There, there happened to be a corroboree when we arrived, but actually that, that was the, the warning system. That was the party who oh, had assembled danger, to repel him. Danger fires and smoke mm. warning, you know, mobs up and down the coast that you know yeah. strangers were approaching. Yeah, unknown. Yeah, yeah. and there's um, there's a um, really great scholar um, Ray Kirkov um, who lives out of Brisbane and he's done a couple of interviews with the Frontier War Stories podcast, Bo Spiram's podcast, which I'd certainly recommend people look up if you're interested in in that kind of military history side and the, and the smoke signals and the site-based historical kind of investigations that, that Ray's been doing. Mm. Yeah. Um, and um, from our friend Ruth D'Souza, what thoughts do you have about what enhances Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal collaboration from your point of view and this recent collab? Mm. I, f for me, you know, before when you talked about not, you know, going to community because over, what, the 30 odd years that you've been, you know, working um, with our community and communities, um, you know, you've developed a knowledge around how that work is done and that a sense of invitation, you know, and um, trust needs to, needs to be there. Um, and so that, you know, very much for me plays a part in it. And I think also just being honest and, and having the tussle when you need to and being able to um, name things really important um you know uh, professor linda uh Y smith speaks about naming as one of the 25 projects in decolonizing methodologies and naming for me includes being able to be very honest with a white collaborator um colleague to be able to name things and not worry that um you know <laughs> a, a white way of doing things um is going to disrupt the need to be honest so um, being able to centre, you know, the the blackness, being able to centre an Aboriginal way of doing things, um, you know, we need to know that you that you can go there mm. um, without um, falling apart when we call you out. And sometimes it involves telling people off. Um, our elders teach us how to do that. I have been ripped plenty of times by my family and my elders, my mum in particular. Um, when they feel you're doing the wrong thing or that you've made a mistake. And part of that um, is how you learn and grow. So, you know, in community we say, you know, to get ripped. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and sometimes getting ripped is so good for you because you need to reset and rethink mm. the way you're doing something. So it's never taking anything for granted. Mm. Um, it's also understanding black anger because it's often misunderstood and used back against us. And we have every right to be angry in this country. You know, our anger is, is justified deeply because um, our well-being is at risk all the time. Um, and our safety and our lives, our very lives. It's one of the reasons I'm wearing that Dajiba Foundation T-shirt, um, uh, which was established by um, uh, a family member of mine, um, April Day, in honour of her mum, Aunty Tanya Day, and other Aboriginal family members who have died in police custody in Victoria and all over this um, colony um, to support those families. And so we, we're living with this all the time it's a, our lived reality so we need to know that the people that are going to come and work with us mm. can take it mm. you know can take um our grief and anger because a lot of people you know can't deal with that the reality um sometimes people want the soft parts of us and what we share culturally and what an elder might share with you but um you know, for us, it means being honest about our anger and our grief and rage and sometimes that's very present with us. So you need to be able to just sit with that and, you know, you, you can do that with us, Claire. So mm. that's why it's important to me. And I think that's at the heart of um, that for me, um, Ruth, in just in response to that question. Um, and also sometimes it's, you know, knowing how to laugh together and getting uh, Aboriginal sense of humour, <laughs> which is <laughs> pretty wild and uh, shocks people at times, I think. But, you know, it's part of our survival, our humour. So, yeah, that's it for me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And all I would just say from myself is, yeah, not taking things for granted. I mean, I find that I do get comfortable and then I, then I you know, I'm told that I'm, Basically, I'm taking something for granted. Um, so I, I learn in, in this sort of jerky way. And, um, and yeah, I, I guess I just... Um, I'm, I, at one point, Pally spoke about the emotional toll of doing this kind of work as well. And, you know, um, that was something that I, I can forget. I mean, because it's not like that for me. And that's, that's something that's a bit shameful but I, that I that I could forget that because I get really inspired and interested about oh where's the work going to go and how, how we're going to impact this or that but but just the the work of doing the work is is different and um so yeah I it's you know when when you say that then I I do you know I'm hearing it sort of thing yeah mm. yeah and I kind of need we'll, to hear it sometimes but yeah. yeah I shouldn't have to but I, I yeah 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 and you know we're We'll remind people. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sometimes it means that you need to end a collaboration mm. or walk away from something. And, and sometimes those actions are misunderstood as well, that, mm. you know, we're unprofessional or that we're unreliable. It's no, we're making a decision that we're not going to work with you. Mm. That's like one of the most professional decisions you could actually make to walk away from something that's not working or it's not going to be beneficial to your community, knowing, knowing mm. when to call it. Mm. Um there's a couple of really good questions and we've got like seven minutes left. Uh, what were the stories of Cook that you both heard growing up as kids? <laughs> Your body language just sunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, look, mine was, I distinctly remember at primary school um, being told that we had been discovered and um, uh, that, you know, he was some sort of hero and I remember starting to argue with my teachers. That was the moment I started to argue with my teachers and that was the moment I started to be described as problematic, having a chip on my shoulder, being angry, um, being a hateful person, you know, and I was a little kid. I'm being told I was all of these things and treated like that by my teachers and white, um, you know, kids who I thought might be my friends at school. So, you... Yeah, it shaped how I moved at mm. school. Mm. Um, and then I got into a lot of arguments uh, with my history teacher at high school because, yes, I took history because I was fascinated by it, but I couldn't understand why there was no Aboriginal content. And I kept saying, we're on Yorta Yorta country. Like, what, where, why isn't there even a story about Yorta Yorta people in here? And I remember my history teacher being very flustered with me and very annoyed and my teachers, yeah, treating me... Like a pain. I had a couple that were supportive of me, but 
Yeah, mm. but where at home the story was, oh, Cook was a crook, a pirate. He didn't do that much. He had a lot of help from Indigenous people all over the world to do what he did. Um, they they beat him up to something more than he was, you know. And so that's that was the counter narrative I had about, mm. you know, the reality of him. Mm. I guess the, the the thing for me is that I don't have a memory of of being told about this foundational myth because it wasn't a surprise to me. You know, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I found. I guess I have memories of just really boring things like, um, you know, having to learn about the parliamentary system um, and, you know, being so bored in history that I just quit history in year nine. I'm now a historian and, you know, that's because I needed to know history because I was an activist and um, I wanted to support Aboriginal struggles and fortunately met Gary Foley and he said, you've got to, you know, you sort of got to know the land, the history of what's happened here. And, you know, so that is actually a really, really strong interest of mine. But, you know, the way it was taught wasn't engaging in the li- in the slightest. But, yeah, just, yeah, just the fact that um, my, the education system didn't rub up against me, you know, it was for me and um, it's it's not something that I have have these memories of at all yeah Mm. that yeah and that doesn't surprise me they're the conversations i have with um you know other white people i know and and my students Mm. they they never had a moment of contestation about it um so it really demonstrates how we move through these education systems that are not designed for us as aboriginal students and children um you know and we see aboriginal students um despite this excel and be exceptional students, be gifted students, um, be very informed, um, you know, little historians themselves and cultural people. Critical thinkers. Critical (laughs) thinkers, highly analytical, like the ideal student, exactly what you want as a teacher. Um, And so often a lot of Aboriginal kids and and Torres Strait Islander kids do better at university um, because that that kind of critical skill base is valued. Um, So we see that over again. Um, We've got Four minutes to go. It may be a very, very quick last one. Do either of you have personal views about what can happen next at, at Cook's Cottage site? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I started off sort of feeling like there has to be a counter monument, like next to it, the same size, um, to just negate it or something. Um, you know, there's a, a other options of, of uh, blowing it up, um, things like that. Um, you know, valid um, suggestions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Kate's um, fantastic idea about the um, um, what is it called? The camera obscura. The camera obscura yeah. of projecting and seeing into the cottage and and seeing the outside, seeing country. You know, seeing cool and country um, in mm. a sense projected or envisioned inside and sort of you know flipping the whole space. I love mm. the idea of that. Um, yeah. Of, of Kate Golding. That's such a beautiful concept. Mm. So. Personally, as many, many things I would do to it, I'd like to um, live in it for a while and have people <laughs> stay in it and, I don't know, B&B. B&B it and have black history classes in there and do all sorts of things. I'd love to hear what, you know, Professor Foley and Uncle Robbie Thorpe and um, Annie Marge Thorpe, um, you know, Annie Dyke Kerr, um, Annie uh, Nawi, Carolyn Briggs, what they would like to do, you know. So let's, let's see. Yeah. And just worth, um, you know, mentioning that, within the Fitzroy Garden says that there's a culturally modified tree right there. It's like within, you know, 50 yards of, of the cottage. And so there's this really, you know, um, uh, it doesn't it doesn't push itself on anyone at all. It's sort of, you know, you could walk past and not notice it, but it, it speaks to, you know, the, the history of this place and the continuing occupation of this place so much. Um, and it'd be amazing to see um, some of those other um, narratives. Um, yeah, get much more prominence. Yeah, I think we have like a minute left, so you have to do some sort oh of Oh, my goodness. Okay, so out. thank you for <laughs> joining us. Um, don't forget to subscribe to this Knowledge Melbourne YouTube channel to stay up to date with our Melbourne Conversations events. Um, the City of Melbourne holds these Melbourne Conversation events monthly, so check out City of Melbourne's website for more information on the program. And it really is a very enriching and really interesting program, so definitely um, in a genuine sense encourage people to, to stay tuned. Yeah, thank you. And, yeah, thanks to everyone that was able to be here in very small numbers and um, to, yeah, everyone who's listening. And thank you again to the City of Melbourne Conversations and all of our collaborators on this.